So essentially, um, I went to go and see Drake for the assassination vacation tour at the O2 in Greenwich. Um, and um, it was a fun night. One of my um, one of my probably favorite gigs I've been to in a while. Not because of the intimacy, not because of any of that sort of stuff, but just because the fact that Drake is like, you know, one of the biggest stars out there right now, let alone in hip hop, just in music um, overall. And I think it's probably the first time maybe outside of a metal gig, outside of maybe seeing Iron Maiden, maybe seeing Slipknot, all those kind of people. It's probably the first time I've gone to see like a really big, like um, top tier artist play um, somewhere. And there is always something a little bit different about those kind of sets because, you know, by and large, they have loads of openers. By and large, the intermissions are really long. By and large, their sets are usually quite long. Um, by and large, they sometimes feel a bit disconnected because they're, they're dancing all the way up uh, up over there, whatever it may be called. But this set was probably one of the funnest ones because I think Drake has really achieved something quite incredible with the, you know, maybe with the set design, with the fact that, you know, it's one big, massive rectangular platform that has um, a sort of, I think it's a screen on it that kind of projects um, certain images that flow, that, you know, um, hover above the air, whether it's a car, whether it's these little tiny robot things. Um, he's created a stage that basically allows him to perform on that entire rectangular stage by himself with no one else on the stage apart from a few dancers that come out here and there and still kill it. And I think it's a skill that, um, I think it's something that he's been able to add to his repertoire that a lot, a lot of people are, are probably haven't done before. And something I'm sure people are going to be doing later in the, in the future going forward. I think maybe the only thing I've seen similar to it was maybe Kanye West performances um, when he was doing the, um, what's the one we did with the, with the mountain, he had a mask on. That was quite good and very theatrical. And it was mostly him on his own on an NPC machine. There was a few kind of dancers and choreographers that come out towards the end. He did it as well, kind of the same sort of way when he was performing with Kid Cudi for the Kid See Ghost thing um, during the Golf Wang tour. And there's been a few more. Maybe Jay-Z's done it a few times, but it's obviously quite a hard thing to do, to be on a stage on your own, perform, especially when it comes to rap, and be able to kind of, you know, smash it. And he actually smashed it to smithereens. But before we go to the Drake performances, let's ring it back a bit. We went there, we got there about 7 p.m., um, by and large, trying to get a bit earlier because my friend had to buy some merch. So we went there about seven. Um, as we rocked up to the venue, uh, as we rocked up on just on the Jubilee Land alone, you could tell, you know, you could feel the electricity in, electricity in the air, right? Just heading to the O2. And I think that's what basically separates the top tier artists, right? I think for the most part, I think when I've gone to see like someone at Coco, I've gone to see someone at the um, O2 Academy, you know, by and large, you probably might feel the energy and the vibe by the time you get to the queue, but you could feel the electricity in the air. You could feel the sense of anticipation just from being at Stratford Station alone, right? People are gearing up to go see this um, big star, Drake, someone that everyone's followed from the onset. I think maybe with Drake, the thing that's maybe special of him is the fact that we've kind of seen his ascendancy, right? We've seen his trajectory from the ground up. We've, we've subscribed to him when he was on mixtapes. We've seen all that stuff. We've seen the little Wayne Coast sign. We've seen the cash money thing. We've seen the OVO thing. Uh, we've seen the kind of direction that he's kind of floated up on and we've kind of been part of the journey. And along the way, he's kind of provided us with soundtracks that have kind of been, um, um, you know, that have kind of provided the soundtracks to our lives or to moments of our lives that are very important, especially for me anyway, going through that kind of, you know, 17 to 25 sort of age age range, you know, that's really important the kind of music you listen to. So we go on train, you can feel the hype. Everyone's kind of excited to see the show. We go out and we get out at the O2 Academy, like, I mean, the O2 Greenwich. He loads of people there, ready to have a good time. Um, immediately as I'm coming out of the O2, I kind of think maybe I might have overdressed. Not because I was dressed smart, but because I just had loads of layers on. I had like a bomber jacket and a hoodie. I had like big combat trousers on as well. I had my Balenciaga triple S's, which are not the most comfortable shoes to wear during a gig. The less the better, the better. But um, as soon as I come out of the station, I had a feeling that, oh, I think I did a bit of a oopsie on that one, right? In terms of the outfits, because... When I come out of the station, yes, they were the you know the usual girls you'd see under the age of twenty one, not really wearing much, you know, um, little t shirts, little crop tops, not having you no know, jackets because they don't want to go to the cloakroom. That was there. But again, I think when you're that age, your the way you the way you the way you experience cold isn't the same as um, old folks like me, right? You, you can probably handle um, not wearing much, going out, you know, having a good time, and you're fine, right? But I think for olders like me, you're kind of like, you know, always cold, always mindful about how you're going to feel when you come back home. So in the media, I saw him, I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm not going to compare myself to some 16, to some 17, 18 year old girl, right? Then I see a couple of dudes, right, who look kind of look maybe, like they're not, you know, as young as those girls, but still, you know, not as young, 
not as old as I am, wearing nothing as well, just wearing a t-shirt with some jeans on or a long sleeve top. And I was like, oh, fuck. Damn it, damn it, damn it. I fucked up. Because then I remembered that. Because I think in my head, I had the idea that we had seat, we had seats, right? We didn't. We were on the standing, we were, we were on standing room. We were in the, um, we were in the standing section, like, the, the, you know, just around the rectangular thing. So I was like, because I thought if we had seats, at least I can stuff my jacket underneath my chair as I was standing up watching a show. But that wasn't true. And then, oh, then we finally get there and we're going to stand around to go get so much my friend and I'm already feeling cold and I've already got a hoodie and a jacket and I'm like oh shit it's not gonna be a good night then we see the merch the merch is quite nice um it's a bit expensive for what I'm used to probably because I'm used to going to metal shows and punk shows and the merch is quite cheap but 35 pound for a t-shirt screen printed not really my thing but that being said the designs of the t-shirts were fucking awesome I gotta be honest the designs were really really nice um he really did went above and beyond I think he got my friend um not my friend but someone that I know I hate people say my friend because he's not really my friend, right? Um, I haven't spoken to him in years, and you know, I don't know his mum's name. He doesn't know my mum's name. You know, he's not my friend. But some dude that I know, or I've been, or I've known from back in the day in forum times. Um, Iron Coops, you might know him, but his name's Julian. Um, he's designer of Stray Rats, and he designed um most of the Assassinations tour merch. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Creative Direction in general, but I'm not too sure. But I know that he did the merch. I remember him tweeting about it a while back. Um, so he designed some of the merch, and it had some really cool merch. They had like a neon, a neon, t- a neon green T-shirt that looked fucking awesome. A white t-shirt they had like a navy blue hoodie a black hoodie and a couple of long sleeves and most of the stuff had sold out i think in the bigger size i think a lot of people went to go, i went a lot, I think a lot of people just got larger than xl just because you know they're easy to wear loads of mediums were left and smalls and shit that was cool um but by and large yeah the merch was quite nice the queue was massive to get the merch they had loads of little places to get it but that was quite good as well they had like a massive they had like a big little um poor cabin place to get it where you can scoot up and go get it there. Then as you're approaching the front of the O2, um, now named the O3 in honor of Drake, that another little section you can buy merch that was kind of in that was kind of um on the side of the building, sort of like a little hole you could buy merch from there. And then I think inside there was another place to buy merch as well. No, no problem, no, no problem, no hassle. Waited about half an hour to get the merch, about half an hour, 35 minutes to get it. After we got it, we queued up to go get uh, to go kind of enter. The arena. Then as we entered the arena, um, we think we found out that supposed to be because my friend had an O, my friend was on O2, we could supposed to be going to the blue room, which is a little sort of like um VIP ish kind of um O2 priority members room that you could go into, have a drink. There was a free cloak room. Um, you could access to easy access to the toilet that's inside the arena. Loads of comfy chairs. Just in general, just a fucking cool little spot that I didn't know existed. Only if you're an O2 customer, which was fucking awesome, right? So we queue up, we go in there, and we, you know, again, you find a cloakroom that's free, so I end up putting my jacket in there. I leave my hoodie with me just in case I need it, which I probably shouldn't have left with me because I was sweating it. I was fucking sweating it out and it made it stink like fuck, but hey, ho, what can you do? We hung in there for a bit, and then that's, came, that, that's when the real surprise started, right? We hung in there, and the surprise started in terms of the prices of the fucking drinks. <laughs> Oh fuck! I ended up getting a couple of James, a couple of double Jamesons, um, on the rocks of my for me, and my friend, um, and I paid twenty six pound, I think, or twenty six or twenty four pound. I was like, oh my god, twenty four pound for double two double Jamesons, uh, uh, like neat, nothing else. It's like wow, wow. And again, you forget how expensive these things are. I guess in general, that's how they make their money back. I guess um, in terms of the the cost, but. I don't think that's true because the retail price of those tickets was like £120 or something, right? I think even seats were really expensive. I don't think you could get a seat cheaper than that. So it wasn't the most cheapest concert in the world. So it's like hundred and something pounds to pay for. I think resellers were shutting their tickets for about 70 to 140 Then you go inside there and, you know, most they don't really have a cloak that you can pay for, I don't think. I think the only cloak is that kind of O2 sort of like a, a blue room place. Then the drinks are fucking 24 quid. It's like, whoa, insane. The, um, the only good thing they did, or one of the good things to help help it out, is like um, most places, especially those places, they don't let you bring in bottled drinks. You can bring in a bottle, but you're not allowed to bring in a lid, I'm assuming, because they don't want you to chuck it on the stage. The only good thing they did, did do, oh, that copy's giving me fucking uh, burn. The only good thing that they did do was that they allowed you to bring your bottles of water in, but you could uh, you could get it filled up for free behind the bar. They could put some water in for you. So that was quite cool, right? And most of the water was quite cold and shit. 
Um, if your bottle is big enough, they can actually chuck in some crushed ice there for you too. So that makes things a bit more manageable. But imagine paying 24 quid for two Jameson, two double Jamesons. Like, insane. But anyway, I guess in those kind of places, you're not really looking to get smashed anyway, right? It's a gig. You want to have fun and have a bit of drink. We hang in there. We have a good time. We're chilling. Um, when we walk in, uh, Back and Not Nice is playing. He's kind of going through the last three songs or so. And again, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Back and Not Nice. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's g- nice, no pun intended, to see him on such a big of a stage. To see Drake kind of really bringing him up and really kind of giving the opportunity to kind of, you know, practice and play in front of such a big crowd. I think it's something that's not something that you can take for granted. After that, Tory Lanez came on um, for a little bit. Intermissions in between, I think about of like, let's say 20 to 30 minutes of intermissions based um, most of it I think was that girl called Tiffany Culver who a lot of people know who I don't know she was playing some tunes going through the whole you know hip hop um, kind of work it um, vision sort of repertoire of songs which you know can get a little bit boring but you know it was fun at the time but you know it's not hmm how do I describe it it's not the most interesting stuff in the world because it's, it's the same I don't know 60 songs they all play again and again and again it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't change that's the thing that only angers me a little bit about stuff. It's like, come on, man, come with something harder. Again, I know for sure if I was, I know for sure if that was me and I was that situation, I just want to come a little bit harder with more interesting things. I guess maybe if you're um, the Drake's tour DJ, it's not really the opportunity for you then to kind of be a little bit more avant-garde. That isn't really the opportunity for you because, you know, I'm sure um, Drake's audience is quite, you know, generic in that respect. They just want to hear the hits. They don't want to hear your fucking B-sides or deep cuts and shit. But you can be a little bit more interesting in terms of stuff that you play. That's what I think anyway. But again, maybe I'm wrong in that respect. Um, the set went... Um, he, she played pretty cool. Cool music. I wasn't I wasn't too mad at it, to be honest. Then um, Tory Lanez came on. He had a pretty awesome set too. He did that annoying thing where he plays like 30 seconds or a minute tops of his famous tracks like you know opening verse a bit of the chorus then it cuts off opening verse but the chorus cuts off same same thing really hash again and again that was a bit annoying but the one thing that was great about Tory Lanez was his singing ability I didn't know Tory Lanez could sing that well live he was amazing he's got a re- he can really sing like sing sing for real he's got a great voice that was awesome to see him how he commanded that stage and again seeing him commanding that stage too was really good he was I, I think I've seen a lot of videos of him performing at loads of kind of LA based shows I think it might have been Coachella. It might have been um, Rolling Loud or one of those countries where he's kind of, you know, moshing and jumping into a crowd and jumping up the fucking, um, what you call it, um, traversing up the um, scaffolding and stuff. Like, he's just, he goes a bit nuts in these shows as well. He's always been quite a good live performer, but see him live again, a different experience. Um, not as small as I thought he'd be on stage. He's a lot bigger than uh, he looks on camera. He looks very small on camera, but not that small in real life. Then we had a really long intermission and then Drake comes out. Um, and, you know, the crowd is fucking electric, to say the least. Um, there's a cube, that rectangular cube happens, a curtain descends over it. Usually everyone's kind of walking through the down the runway that kind of links to the rectangular cube. But this time Drake kind of pops up from the bottom, which was fucking awesome. See him popping over, ah, it's like screaming. See him right next to you was quite weird. Um, again, I'm not a starstruck kind of dude, but this, basically we were, we were standing right at the back of the square. So he got to see him a lot because he kept walking back and forth to pick up a bit, a bit of his drink that he had. So you got to see him a lot. So it's quite weird to see him like up 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 close in person. Very a buff dude, um, really big, a lot bigger than he looks like on camera. Again, you know, just saying this because I know I don't really see these guys in real life. So if it comes across a bit cringy, I don't care. My podcast say what I want. Um, so we see him play for a bit. He starts off very slow. I think eight out of ten cats and a few other things. I think he mi- he mixed up the playlist a little bit from the stuff I've seen him play in other shows.